construct testing for all engine frames for the Gemini missile program when they were putting the satellites up around the Earth then. So I'm a, from, from a high-tech background, from a very, uh, as a useful person, my uh, father, my grandfather, uncles and whoever, they were all carpenters and builders. I was raised a carpenter and a builder. By the time I was 18 or 15 years of age, I'm, I'm doing architectural lot plot and three-dimensional structural design by adding the rooms and dens to people's homes. But my father, my father and his contract buddy, they would get my plans and I did all the specs and specifications for them. And they would take my plans and sign them and put their names on them and get them passed and go build rooms. Well, they paid me, but that's me. So I was a very lucky young man to grow up, to have a lot of skills and a lot of trades and professions. I spent four years in the United States Air Force instructor repair my performance aircraft and being honored by base commanders as tops in my class and stuff. I like that, but I try to tell people this. And the reason I do this is because when I led that armed delegation to the California State Legislature, May 2nd, 1967, Ronald Reagan, the governor, got on television, etc., and said I was a hoodlum and a thug. I said, a hoodlum and a thug? I mean, it was my first lesson in being stereotyped. <laughs> you know, I worked at Gemini Missile Program, you know what I mean? That, that, that was tops, the engineering department. I ain't gonna tell me that crap. But anyway, my support is this here. Working there for the three and a half years that I did, I became interested in civil rights. I went to hear Dr. King speak at the Oakland Auditorium. 7,000 people, 7,000 seats, 7,000 people, every seat was full. I was just one person, and I had this great job, but I began to read and study a lot about my history, African, African American people's history and stuff. And I said, let me go hear this brother Dr. King speak. You know, he's not talking hell and damnation. You know, because I stopped going to church with all that hell and damnation stuff, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, every Sunday, you know what I mean? You're yeah. going straight to hell. <laughs> I, I couldn't blink an eye. Know. I wink my eye at a girl I'm sitting. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, but this preacher, I'm going to go here because he's talking about other things. And Dr. King extolled and talked about how all these companies across America refused to hire people of color. Oh, he talked about every categorical group and business framework there was. And then speaking at the open auditorium, he says, Dr. King says, and here in the San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, Langendorf Bread Company and Kilpatrick's Bread Company would not hire any people of color. He says, and all across America, I say, Wonder Bread Company will not hire any people of color. I say, we're going to have to boycott them, and we want to boycott them so consistently and so profoundly, we want to make Wonder Bread wonder where the money went. <laughs> Dr. King, I mean, that audience, that audience of 7,000 people, I'm one individual, we hit the floor, ovationing this brother. I mean, it was something else. I was truly, truly inspired. So when the, he passed, when Dr. King got the uh, uh, Civil Rights Bill passed uh, in 64, 64, I quit my job at the GNN. I wanted to work in the grand future. And the first place I organized in was right here in the city of Richmond, California. Right here. First, first program, everything I did. Started out with canvassing, me and some four or five other students, three black students and three black white students. We were working together because we were canvassing categorical areas and precinct areas and all that kind of stuff. But we got interested in what we could do to try to end institutionalized racism here in the United States of America. So that's what happened. And with it, I came up with the idea that we should have a tutorial program of some kind on you know, to, to, get, to, to, get a, get, to get the grant from the wall poverty boards and stuff. And that's what we did. We got together, wrote the proposals, found the building, the location right there in North Richmond, up there by Chelsea Street, and, and, and uh, 
we got did all that stuff, you know, we got matching funds, uh, et cetera. Went before the board and showed them that we will have the 10th grader tutoring the uh, first grader, the second grader, uh, the, 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 the 11th grader, the second grader, the, and the 12th grader, the third grader, and so on. And that's what we would do. And we had a little education institution. We were able to hire 100 youth, <laughs> male and female. And uh, in fact, we paid them for $36 a week in the summer, minimum wage. And we paid them uh, 20 hours a week in the winter uh, for uh, 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 tutoring. And those paychecks going back to those in households, it was economic, but yet it's an education type program, you see. And that was the first thing we put together. Now, your city government, about 12 years ago here, called me up and asked me to come out. And uh, I guess it was 12 years ago, because my son, Malik, my oldest son, had just gotten back from uh, Iraq. My son, is in the, he was happy to be in the military army reserves, and he got sent to Iraq to fight for 18 months. And I brought my son, my wife, his wife, and other family members. And your city government surprised me and gave me a proclamation for starting the first youth jobs program here in the city government of Richmond. My wife, too, because once the party got started and later on they put me in jail, the young lady, I wasn't married to her then, but I was married to her later on. But she uh, worked here for two years in Richmond, California, uh, with other programs with the Black Panther Party. But I'm just saying it was jobs programs that I was truly interested in. Because I always had jobs. I worked for World Airways. I could go out and get a job like that, boom, 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 boom. I had the skills, the trades, the background, et cetera. You know what I mean? And uh, it's just, so that's what I was about, wanting jobs for me. Later, I went to work for the city government of Oakland, California. And in effect, there was a place. I read, I put together and read the summer youth jobs program. But in those days, they had about six target areas, particularly in Oakland, that area. But there were target areas all over the San Francisco Oakland Bay area for the Wall and Poverty Programs. But the particular target area I worked in was the North Oakland Neighborhood Service Center, where my actual home was, where I lived in North Oakland, California at the time. But that's where I worked. But, and, and, and it was a time, you understand, 1960. 65, 64, 65, then I went, we, we went to city government of Oakland, California, and a book came out called Black Power, boom, boom, boom. And so some uh, young people were standing on the corner one day talking, we want black power, we go get some black power, we want black power. And I told a young brother who got to the conversation, I said, you ain't gonna get no power until you take over some of these political power seats. What you mean these political power seats? I say them city council seats. I say them county supervisorial seats. Oh, them the white man seats. I say you better put some black folks in the <laughs> white man seats so we can try to change this stuff around here, you know what I mean? And so, you know, they, 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 nobody, so I got in various arguments or discussions with people. I said, no, you don't understand. You can holler black power. But what is power? The power is these people in legislative bodies who make laws, who allocate funds, who pull in taxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and how they disperse that. I said, that's power. I mean, how you finance a police department, whatever, et cetera. I said, all down south. At that time, still working, and this was before the Black Panther Party ever started. My point was is that, let me see how many political seats that black folks are elected to. Black folks and colored folks are elected to. So in counting African American people, 1965, I did a demographic search all across America. I found only 50 black folks do like do elect to the political office at that time. 1965. So what I'm saying here is that if it's only 50, wow, what's going on? Then I found a few more people of color seats, but 
Queen Anne. Then in my demographic research, I found across the South, from the Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, Arkansas, et cetera, and so on, Mississippi and so on, I found counties, counties, some 22 different counties stretching all across these states. Well, the majority of the populations in some of these counties were black folks. I mean, 60% black, et cetera, so on, so on, so on. So I make another argument with some of these young guys. I says, look, these are the counties. I says, now, they passed the voting rights bill. So we gotta get all the people registered to vote, get them registered to vote in there. And in those counties, probably we can get a real righteous, progressive black share, even if we had a white share, but a black share. I said, the Ku Klux Klan act up, start talking about killing and murdering lynching folks. That, the power in this is that, that the, the, the sheriff can deputize 200, 300, 400 black folks, men and women with shotguns, and go kick the Ku Klux Klan's butt. That's the power <laughs> to liberate himself from oppression, murder, and terror. Wow. So, it, so the political seat is important. Right. You know, and, 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 and that was my whole program, to start the Black Mass Party. So we went out to patrol the police. Well, I organized those brothers. You know, you put the, people think that we went out there with law books, tape recorders, and legal guns. With no macho stuff, you know. Well, somebody made some old dumb movie talking about I got my gun, you got your gun, what you gonna do about it? <laughs> That's dumb, you know what I mean? Run around trying to sell gorilla crackers, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, that, that, that was not what it was about. We knew every law on the guns. I told Huey Newton, I said, you in law school, two years in law school, I said, you're gonna research every factor about guns, because we're gonna patrol these police. And why do we take guns? A year earlier, the Watts riots had happened down in Los Angeles, California. Following the Watts riots, following the Watts riots, there was a citizens group put together, and they called themselves the Community Alert Patrol. CAP, they called it, Community Alert Patrol. That group had law books and tape recorders with them. And they would get out of their cars and stand and watch the police to observe the police, that's all. And after a month of that, the police, you know, get teased off with their idiot self, bad mentality. They got them, arrested them, beat them up, took the tape recorders and smashed them up, billy clubs and beat them up, and drug them downtown and locked them up. It's a citizen's group exercise the constitutional right to assemble in the community and watch the police because they didn't want to have any more riots in Los Angeles. What had happened was a vicious beating of a black mother in 1965 when that riot happened in Watts community. That's what kicked that riot off. And what happened with the riot? You know, 65 people killed, 200 wounded, and 5,000 arrested. That was in 65, and this was before I started the Black Panther Party. My point is, how can I organize 5,000 people in a political electoral machine to take over some of these political seats so we can change the police department, so we make rules and laws, et cetera. That's my, that was my whole point. So Black Panther Party was organized for that purpose, and then when we did that and went out there, I trained them how to break down weapons, how to be safe, safe with weapons, etc. I did everything. And I was proficient with weapons. I was proficient with weapons when I was 13. My father bought me my first 30-30 high-powered rifle when I was 13. My father, not only was he a carpenter and a builder, he's an avid hunter. We hunted all over California, from northern to mule-tailed deer up around Mount Chester, etc. back, and we hunted small game, etc. We did this here. I grew up hunting. So I had a 30-30 Winchester. I had a pump shotgun. My father had a 300 Savage lever action with a scope, etc. 
We had, we, the gun is only a tool to be used for a particular situation. Oh, I grew up with guns. Honey, you know, and boom. So when it came to us assembling people, so we had, I had got 14 members in the party. One of them was a sister, Geraldine. And everybody got trained. And I told everybody, I said, look, I said, no, we're going to go out here and patrol. Now, you got the rules down. Nobody talk. Huey says only one person talk. Because we can't go up and interrupt the police officer carrying out his duty. We have to wait and let the post, po police officer say something to us first. And he was in law school, so his law professor and him were putting this stuff together. And boom. So, you know, wait to don't only one, and then, and then when you're only one person talk, and he says, because if we take, the, we, if we get arrested, then we will take the arrest, because we're not scared of the courtroom, and then uh, if only one person talks, then I have 14 of you testify to the exact same thing that happened, rather than a whole lot of her talking. And then she, she said, this is, you know, so we had that thing down to like a science, I'm telling you. And Huey had <laughs> researched the laws and our rights to it, et cetera, and so, et cetera. So we get out of the cars and we walk down into the 7th Street, West Oakland, California, the nightlife area, boom, boom, around Slim Jenkins and all those other joints and places. <laughs> I'm saying, we get out of the car and walk down, it's nighttime, and we walk, police officer, is, his car is kind of out into the street a little bit. But if you know 7th Street is wide, you got three lanes here and three lanes here, and plus parking. And we walked down, and there was a convenience store, and 30, 40 people started watching us, saw us with guns, and said it was night. Everybody was disciplined. I had everybody put their uniforms on. I told them the night before, I said, I want everybody to take a shower, take a bath. <laughs> I want you, if you ain't got a leather jacket, you can have a push jacket, et cetera, and so on. And I want you neat and clean, and make sure you take a bath. One of, one of, one of the brothers said, well, I got to take a bath before I have the troll so old. Funky police people going to beat me up. I said, because we ain't blippies. <laughs> What's a blippy? A black hippie that don't take no bath. <laughs> I said, you ain't gonna go down to the black community trying to patrol the police, stinking and stuff, and you come back, you're gonna organize them. They gonna tell you, boy, you better go home and organize some soap for you when you come down here. So when I, I say all this to say, we were organized. We just not, boom. So we walk up, we stand on the corner, I told everybody to stand, boom, boom, the cop had not looked up, he was right, he was past the side door, though. His arrestee was standing on the back, standing with his hand on the back of the trunk. And so an old man came out, 20, 30 people was watching. Old man said, it's dark. He said, what they got, sticks in their hand? And the guys had long rifles, half of them had long rifles. I carried an army, five and five, I carried, I didn't even carry long rifles. But I'm not, did that. And so somebody said, no, man, those are guns. Old man said, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> So Huey turns around, he says, no, everyone stay where you are. You have a right to stand and observe these police who have been brutalized us in the community. We have a constitutional right to do so, so stand here. And by this time, the cop then got out of the car, and Huey turns around, and the cop says, you have no right to observe me. And Huey says, no, California State Supreme Court ruled the state that every citizen has a right to stand <laughs> Listen to this. No, California State Supreme Court ruled the state that every citizen has a right to stand and observe a police officer to carry out their duty as long as it's kind of reasonable distance away, a reasonable distance in that particular room is constituted with 8 to 10 feet. I'm standing approximately 20 feet from you and will observe you whether you like it or not. <laughs> Some sister standing on the court, she was a well dressed sister. She walked down a slim jigs with a drink in her hand. <laughs> She said, well, go ahead on and tell it. <laughs> as fast as she said that, the cop says, is that gun loaded? He would say, if I know it's loaded, it's good enough. I have a right. He would say, you have no right. You recited something. The United States Supreme Court, somebody who works on them. Therefore, you cannot remove my property from me without due process of law. Step back. You cannot touch my weapon. Mm. Tall black dude over there, he said, 
man, what kind of Negroes is this? <laughs> it's called capturing the imagination of the people. So the act of patrolling the police was a tactic for me to capture the imagination of the people. I put up an office and everything. And you know, that cop left when I said, ladies and gentlemen, Man, on the streets here, I can 30, 40 people. I says, my name is Bobby Seal. I'm chairman of the Black Panther Party. This is my friend Huey P. Newton. He's the minister of defense of the Black Panther Party. I says, now we want to organize a new organization. And I told his brothers and sisters who carried the handguns, they carried the stacks of the 10-point program. We handed a copy of the 10-point program out. And I says, our office is 5624 Grove Street in North Oakland Avenue. We have political education class Wednesday night. 7 p.m. and 2, 2 p.m. on Saturday. Tomorrow is Saturday if you want to visit. And you can find out more about the Black Panther Party. And Huey says, then, but by the way, when you join or work with the party, you do not have to carry a gun. This, this, this is just a tactic here. And but we guys, I said, right, I said, because we're going to organize programs in the community to unite the people, to get their vote, get them ready, get thousands and thousands of them registered to vote so we can get into those political seats and change all them racist exploitation to exploitive laws, et cetera. That's what we're doing. And that's why I went out there with that tactic, that method. The objective is to different, see? So my point of what we did there was to do that. Why? There's only 50 people duly elected political office. And by, by October 66, Quite a few more black folks got elected right around me. Yeah. <laughs> Willie Brown and everybody else, you know, <laughs> and Miller and some others got elected. In those periods, you see, so it, it, that, that's what was happening. I knew all of those guys. And boom, we, we, that first year though, we never had no more than 50 members in the Black Panther Party. I wound up leading an armed delegation to the California State Legislature. Denzel Dow was shot and killed and murdered in Northwestern California. And the family knew me from the tutorial program that I had put together in that same Northwestern community. And they called us up to come out there to investigate that. And we did investigate it. And we had a meeting with the DA and, we, and others. And then they said they didn't have anything to do because right across Chelsea, was the county line of North Richmond. You're outside the city limits and whatever. So we went to see the sheriff in uh, Martinez, et cetera, and so on. I'm just saying, well, ours was method. You know, and people that run around call us school and thugs. Oh, we were well read. We know our African and African American people's history and struggle back and forth and sideways in county, county corner. I knew Native American people's history. I mean, everything. Uh, it, 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 but this was not black people and the, and the power structure and the counterintelligence program and the FBI propagated lies. Like, they would send out press releases to the FBI to not only to the press, they send the same to the, to the uh, to, uh, uh, politicians. Next thing you know, you got Mayor Daly of Chicago on national television saying, the only reason the Black Panthers have guns is to come into the white community and shoot and kill white people. Which was a bold-faced lie. Now, we're running up and down the streets and protest with all our liberal and white left buddies. Right, right. <laughs> we rolled together. We were not. Coalition politics was a great character of what we did in the Black House Park. I'm telling you crossing all racial and ethnic lines. Everybody who wanted to be progressive, who wanted to deal with some real human liberation struggle, we work with them. We were, in effect, my organization wound up being called as well. 39 different organizational groups, including Dr. Martin Luther King's SCLC. Including, I mean, I'm telling you, half of my organization was white liberal organizations and other groups, et cetera all the other people of color, organizations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's called quality and politics. That is what the power structure was made of. That is what they didn't like, because people talk about populist movement, that was populist. You're crossing ethnic and racial and religious lines, you see what I mean? 
We have breakfast programs in the Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church, the Baptist Church, in the school. That, that was what was happening. I'm telling you, they killed Dr. King. I only had 400 members of him down the West Coast. Seven months later, Nixon is elected. I have 5,000 members in 49 chapters and branches all across the United States of America. And I'm going all these months, chapter to chapter, branch to branch, and teaching these brothers and sisters that it's about grassroots organizing around programs. You can unite the community around something tangible and real. And with these programs, they, we have voter registration drives. You will learn to identify your councilmanic districts in your state assembly districts, and et cetera, et cetera, and the politicians and who they are. You will learn to know and get informed. Who's liberal, who's this, who, who et cetera. That's what you want to do, because ultimately we're going to run for political offices anyway. This is what I was teaching, the fine particulars and the methodology of effective grassroots programmatic community organizing. And that's what it's about, the same organizing I did Richmond, California, when I put that tutorial program together in that community. And that was an institutional framework. And I extended that to black history classes in an empty, Saturday empty Lutheran church that the Reverend gave me, that gave me a key to use. And I taught them black history. I have a room full of people like this in that little church. You know, and to make sure they come and get interested, I brought my barbecue pits out there. All right. <laughs> Organizing people, don't be playing with people, be real. Right, right. <laughs> I've been barbecuing since I was 12 years old, too. I learned to barbecue down. In fact, I got to put my barbecue book back on the market. I'm going to do that. The latest book I got out is Power to the People The World of the Black Panthers. It's pictures. You know, two, almost 300 pages of pictures and commentary. Mm -hmm. I do the primary commentary along with a few other Black Panther Party members, people of the family. It gives you of a thing. You can go online and buy it for me. I didn't bring it in today because my other assistant had to go somewhere. And um, I didn't bring that book today. The other books I've written at Season of Time, The Power of the People. Now, the Power of the People is a big, thick coffee table book, hardcover. And it's large, you know what I mean? It's not a regular book. So it's an expensive book, like 50 bucks plus shipping and happening and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I mean, we just published that. That book just came out last September 2016. Um, boom. Now I'm gonna put the cookbook back out. Yeah, and I got a documentary I'm doing too. I've already done my job. Oh no, I did a, I, I, sh I did a barbecue cooking show, PBS in Philadelphia. <laughs> Paid me 24,000. Oh yeah, write this down. I barbecue. <laughs> I barbecue. I mean, I got this from my uncle down in Texas. I'm telling you, I live in Texas. The man had brother my uncle, I was 12 years old, we was down there with church association time, because I was raised here from eight years of age. But we would go back in the summer, they called church association time, and that August month, just before school start, you know what I mean? And we down there a month. But I wanted to go with my cousin in Liberty, Texas, to go over there with him with Uncle Tom Turner. Now, Uncle Tom Turner was not a Uncle Tom, that's just his name. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Tom, Uncle Tom had a business. Tom had a visit with barbecue, he sold beer in there, etc. And his barbecue was so good that the white folks say, Tom, way back, this is in the 50s, discrimination was still going on. Says, Tom, now you got some good barbecue, and we got we, we can't come in there because they say we can't sit down with the white black folks. But why don't you build a second place over here on the white side? Tom Tom was in good business. He built the six <laughs> So when I went there at 12, oh yes, I would serve the black folks over here and serve the white folks over here. You know what I mean? That's how good his barbecue was. But I learned barbecue then, because we were down there for that two weeks. I mean, I wrote about that in my cookbook. But I'm going to re redo my cookbook and put it out there. 
but barbecuing, food, and stuff like this, notice something. Free food program. I gave away 10,000 full bags of groceries in the Oakland Auditorium. 10,000. We, that day alone, we registered 4,700 some odd people to vote. How do you give 10,000 bags of groceries away? Mm. My coordinator this see me and said, Chairman, how are we gonna do that? I said, you gonna do this. I don't care what you say. <laughs> And the, and the word was out that the FBI, head, district head of the FBI in San Francisco, the mayor himself, Mayor Redding at that time, and uh, uh, the chief of police were in the mayor's office laughing and says, oh, you know, it was all over the news. Bobby Seale said he's going to give away 10,000 bags of groceries. And John, have you ever seen 10,000 chickens in 10 supermarkets? No. Wow, they are falling in their face with that crap. That's what they said. Man, you don't be playing with me. I'm an organizer. <laughs> I'm an architect. I deal in specifics, particulars, etc., and so on. Right on down, you know? And I said, how, how wide is that stage up there? Well, I think it's about, I said, measure the stage. They measure. <laughs> how deep is it? Boom, boom, boom. I said, all right, now. The second main curtain, do I have 40 feet? Yes, sir, Jim. You have 42 feet. All right, I said, I want, I want, Eight foot long tables, two of them, a one foot out, two tables, one foot out. Calculate all the surface space on top and multiply it by two. The surface space on top and the bottom. Well, we're going to have the 800 cubic inches. I said, no, we want the 1400 cubic inch bag. The bag, you know that regular bag? I said, that's what I want. How many cubic inches? 1400. I said, all right. How many cubic inches is, is, is in a 16 ounce tin? So I said, okay. How many, cubic, how many 16 ounce tins can I get in the bottom bag? Boom, boom, boom. Multiple, I said, Bummer. I said, now, nah, we got to fill this bag up. I said, what about puff wheat? I said, puff wheat is wholesome, et cetera. And boom, the puff wheat take up a whole lot of energy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, this is the way, I'm an organizer. I want, another time, we did the second time we did I said, I want potatoes. <laughs> Brother Ken, gentlemen, Bobby, we went all over the bear. Ain't nobody got no 50,000 pounds of potatoes, Jim. <laughs> You're talking about five pounds of potatoes in every bag. And we're like, what are we going to do? We're going to have to call it off. I said, don't you come here. I, what are we going to do? <laughs> and we had the money. And I said, have you ever heard of Idaho? <laughs> get up to Idaho and get me some damn potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, man. And then we had to have, you had an organizing thing. So I really needed a lot of extra people, which I used to do all the time anyway. I went to the University of California, had me a rally, boom, 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 and talked some 600 white left radical buddies and friends and people to come and work and bag groceries. I went to the churches and got about 40 sisters out of the different churches. And then I had a little gang in the communities, one in Richmond and over there, we cut them and pulled them in, and made them have a bank account, et cetera. And I got these young gang guys loading up. I had somebody go out to canneries and stuff, drop the labels and whatever, et cetera, and get the canned goods, you know, boom, in. And I got the young gang guys now working and doing something constructive, right. helping to put the, the, and the sisters in the church in every other chair. And if that box says peas, they're writing peas on it, you know what I mean? And put it that Organize. And we organized that. And then I, in Laney College, across the street from Arbiter, I had to clean out that whole big area, something like that area out over there. And every four, we had rows of, of, of bags. And we deal with inches. If you got Synodon giving us something, measure the length, width, and height, and break it down to inches, items, and inches. You know, and boom, so cubic inches. So, and then we fill the bag up. And the chickens, I wanted three and a half to four pound chickens. Went out to Foster Farm way back then. And got out there and I said, well, we, we, we gotta make sure that I get up to four pounds. How, you, how, you, how do we know that you're gonna do that? So he took me inside one of these gigantic sheds and rows and rows and rows 
multi thousands of chickens and the lights are on or just eating because they dropped his feed in front of them. Just eating. And the guy turned out the lights and all the chickens stopped eating. Every chick stopped eating because the lights were turned out. Then he turned the lights back on, the chickens all went back to eat. You have to imagine 10,000 chickens. Wow. He says, We can gauge the weight. It's uh oh. -uh. Down to size. I said, I want them in freezer trucks, had them in freezer trucks. We had 10,000 chickens. Now, people coming in, because I've announced this on radio, et cetera, boom, 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 boom. I got to go to registrars, registering people to vote. I mean, I got hundreds of voter registrars. And then when you come in, all the entrance doors to the Oakland Auditorium, on both sides, you have real medical doctors and assistants there giving everybody who come in a six cell anemia test. Mm. All we have to do is take, get that blood, put an electrophoresis slide and get their name and they walk in. So we testing everybody, including some of our white friends who came, you got tested, <laughs> six cell <laughs> to come in the door. So we got six cell anemia testing, we got the grocery bags, we register people to vote, and then I got Santana. <laughs> ah, for an hour. Then I got John Lee Hooker for another hour. <laughs> Who was that? Sisters Love. They were another group back in those days. The entertainment, you know? And so after everybody's in, then and only then can you put the chickens in the bag because the chickens are right at 32 degrees. <laughs> See what I mean? You can't have no chickens sitting around for three, four, five hours. Yeah. Boom. So all the people who was registering to vote, taking six, seven, me tests, and all this other kind of stuff, now they're behind the scene putting the chickens in every bag. And John Lee Hooker, and I'm big wolf of speakers. I don't want you to be no boo. And that band is just playing and rocking that house. 7,000 people in this place. You know? And they're walking, talking to me, the chickens, in the, the, chickens, the chickens are in the bags behind the curtain, the chickens are in the bags behind the other rooms. Boom, 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 boom. I said, okay, tell Johnny who this is his last song. <laughs> we come to the stage. Sister Audrey Jones was on the left-hand side of the stage at another microphone. It's a 90-foot wide stage. Big man Albert Howard was on this side. And uh, I said, brothers and sisters, the mayor, the FBI, and chief of police said we couldn't give away no damn 10,000 bags of groceries. I said, brothers and sisters, people, human beings, today we said 10,000, we have 10,000 bags of groceries. And the curtains went straight up. And the lights in the ceiling made the plastic bag that the chickens was in or sea of it glitter. <laughs> and in silence, this audience, of 7,000 brothers and sisters. And somebody said, damn! <laughs> <laughs> and somebody said, and everybody actually stood up and gave an applause. I said, brothers and sisters, thank you. I says, now, you are sitting in color-coded sections. Every team, when you organize, you gotta get down to the nitty gritty. Right. I said, from this side, the microphones was shipped to speakers over here, and big man Albert Howard would tell the blues, the red, et cetera, where to be going, and how to get back and stand, and Audrey Jones, Sister Audrey Jones over here, Sister Audrey Jones is now Dr. Dunham. But my point, she will, but in 45 minutes, we have given all those groceries away. People have gone home, et cetera. Them chickens did not spoil. Because if those chickens had spoiled, your whole program is dead. Right. But we got 4,700 people registered to vote that day. Grassroots and programmatic community organizing. All for the goal objective of taking over some of the political seats. When you say power to the people, yes, power to the people. I love everything Bernie Sanders wrapped and outlined programs. I don't argue socialism. 
you see, because it gets too mixed up when people want to sit up and argue, because I can't stand state control, command economy socialism concepts. Oh, it's, well, this is why I'm, let's make a distinction here. It doesn't mean I'm against socialist programs. I don't care for Politburo, Stalinistic Politburo, state control, command economy socialism. Wait a minute. My slogan was all power to all the people. So what do we mean by that? We mean that we want that legislation and we want to make legislation and policies that empower the people, that give the people their rights, et cetera. You know, whether it's health care, et cetera, et cetera. This is what we're talking about. You see what I mean? So grassroots community control is much more important than some Trump do thinking that he's going, you know, well, I don't even want to mention this guy. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to motivate people to understand the necessity of the real grassroots. And every corporate framework needs to recognize and relate to that basic real community control. Not trying to control our political seats for some, uh, for some uh, nefarious, avaricious corporate monopoly exploitation and capitalism. We want the people to have community control. The people in the committees and committee leadership in the community, whether it's nonprofit entity frameworks or what, that's what's happening. You know, so when I say when in the course of human events become necessary, or when I say when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursues and invariably evinces a design to reduce a people under absolute despotism, then I say it's the right of the people to alter change that government and provide new guards for their future security and happiness. That's all right. Declaration of Independence, the founding goal objective of, 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 of what democracy and, and freedom and, and human rights should be about. Above and beyond all, that's, that, that, that's what it's coming from. That's what it's about. Power to the people. Thank you very much. Woo!